Welcome to Virology Live. This is session number 25. Today we're going to talk about therapeutic viruses. We are going to see what good we can make of viruses. And uh, it is the last session of this online virology course, which I originally did as an experiment. And uh, I think it worked. I think we had a lot of interest. We had a wonderful community gathering here with great questions. I think the format works. So this encourages me to do future online courses. And I, my next planned one, as I mentioned last time, will be Viruses Live, an advanced course, which you need this one to understand, uh, where we'll go through individual viruses uh, in each session. Today we're going to talk about uh, uh, several different aspects of therapeutic viruses we're going to use, or I should say, applications for therapeutic viruses. And yes, today we have green lighting to uh, match my shirt. Um, I tried red, but the, the light, I couldn't get a red out of the light. I want it to be complimentary to the green and it would be a festive, blah, 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 but it didn't work out. So the, the applications of uh, viral therapy uh, therapeutic viruses today. We're going to talk about phage therapy for bacterial infections. We're going to talk about using viruses for gene therapy to deliver a gene to patients who either lack the gene or carry defective versions of it. We're going to talk about using uh, viral vectors to deliver antigens and what we would otherwise cause vaccines. And then we will end up with using viruses to cure cancers, viral oncotherapy. A key part of everything we're going to do today is infectious viral DNA. None of what we're going to talk about today would be possible without the ability to molecularly clone DNA copies of viral genomes. And this, this ability was first demonstrated with poliovirus, as shown on this slide. As we know, the viral RNA, the plus-stranded viral RNA, if introduced into cells and culture by transfection, is infectious, it will initiate an, an infectious cycle and you will get virus produced. If you make a DNA copy of the viral RNA by synthesizing a DNA using reverse transcriptase in vitro in a test tube, you can then put that DNA in a bacterial plasmid to propagate it in bacteria and make more of it. If you introduce that DNA into cells, it will initiate an infectious cycle. Uh, and if you make RNA in vitro using a T7 RNA polymerase, you make RNA in vitro, transfect the RNA, that also initiates an infectious cycle. And so the, this in vitro RNA synthesis, of course, th is the basis for making mRNA vaccines. The same procedure is used, only on a bigger scale. The RNA is more infectious than the DNA, and so uh, most applications involve in vitro transcription or RNA synthesis of some kind, as we'll see in a bit. Now, this discovery uh, was done by me uh, back in 19, let's see, I want to go to this. I want to show you the paper. 1981, uh, here is the science paper, cloned poliovirus complementary DNA is infectious in mammalian cells. A complete cloned DNA copy of the RNA genome of poliovirus was constructed, cultured cells transfected with this plasmid produced infectious virus. This is the ultimate in simplicity. This is the science paper. Now they've all become more fancy and elaborate and involved. But in this paper, we um, had uh, one figure showing the construction of the plasmid containing the full-length DNA, which we would never publish anymore, but it was unique back then. And we had a table showing experiments with uh, various enzymes to prove that the infectivity came from the DNA. And that's it. And then me and David Baltimore were with the authors. So this began this uh, field of infectious viral DNAs. And I have to say, this was a, a good paper, and it got me my job at Columbia, among other places as well, which I didn't take, uh, including Stanford, as I've mentioned. I, I declined to go there. Too many palm trees. But uh, 
I went to Columbia based on this paper and also the paper doing the genome sequence of poliovirus. So this now enables this field, but I had no idea at the time, of course. I did think that it would be useful, but not for therapy, for sure. So phage therapy, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk a bit about this. Uh, in fact, you may remember from the very beginning of this course, 1915 phages were discovered, and one of the discoverers was Derel, and he pursued their use to treat bacterial infections because he said the phages kill bacteria, so let's do that. He founded the Eliava Institute in 1923, which is active to this day in Georgia. Uh, and uh, this company produced phages for antibacterial therapy during World War II. In fact, you can find uh, kits from soldiers, and one of the things they have in the kits is a little vial of uh, phage for treating infections. Unfortunately, in the 1930s, we discovered antimicrobial drugs in, in larger numbers, and that dampened enthusiasm for phage therapy, and so much research stopped, although the Eliava Institute continued always. A lot of other initiatives stopped. But now, as you know, we have widespread resistance to antimicrobial drugs, and this has uh, sparked renewed interest in using phages to treat bacterial infections, although there are many obstacles. There are many limitations. They are not going to be uh, the magic cure, but they will help. And let's look at some examples. So one uh, one kind of phage therapy would be the use of lytic bacteriophages, that is, bacteriophages that kill the bacteria. We don't, we don't want them to become lysogenic and, and not kill the bacteria. So use lytic bacteriophages to kill uh, specific bacterial bacteria. Um, you don't want to kill our normal flora, right? So these have to be specific phages, which is not a problem. We can do that. However, it complicates production of the therapy. You have to first identify the pathogenic bacterium that's causing the disease, which is often possible. Uh, and then you have to find a phage that will kill it. So it's almost as if you tailor the phage to the patient, which is a new kind of drug, right? And, and we're going to have to get used to that. Now, uh, we have already uh, licensed phage lysins. Lysins are proteins encoded by the phage genome that lyse the bacteria. Here's an example in this little figure here of uh, a lysin, which has uh, dis digested away the, uh, the peptidoglycan in the membrane of the bacteria which would happen normally to release the phage. But when, when this happens, of course, you have changes in os osmotic pressure. The cell ruptures and it dies. So these are used for surface decontamination, the actual proteins themselves. Now, agrophage is a phage approved uh, by the EPA in 2005 to treat f bacterial tomato canker in the field, uh, a disease of tomato caused by bacteria. And list shield is a phage of listeria, the bacteria Listeria, which cause foodborne illnesses, severe foodborne illnesses, has been approved by the FDA for treating meat and poultry. Not for giving to people, but we treat the meat to decontaminate it because Listeria can often contaminate these products before we get them. And uh, this was the first designation of phage therapy as GRAS, generally regarded as safe. But of course... As you know, there's going to be there's going to be objections to the use of phage, as there is for vaccines and almost everything else. There have been some recent clinical successes in using phage therapy. I want to highlight some of them here. Uh, I, I have um, talked about these on various podcasts. So the first one: phage treatment of an aortic graft infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this was in a patient, and here we have Paul Turner on the paper. And uh, someone asked earlier in this course if I would ever met him. And in fact, we did a Twivo with him, with Nels, and that's Twivo 44, the enemy of my enemy is my phage. So uh, Paul talked about this story. And this was a patient that had a um, aortic graft that got infected. And they actually, uh, they opened the patient up and they they were going to inject the phage into the uh, the graft, but it, 
apparently it was too fragile and they didn't want to do that. So they just poured it on top of the graft, sewed him back up, and he actually did better. He lived uh, a, quite a while. And unfortunately, he died the day the paper was published, uh, of, of not of infection, of other complications. But it's a very good story. And um, uh, we have links to some of this, the, the story articles in, in the Tuiva. Then we have this one. Engineered bacteriophages for treatment of a patient with disseminated drug-resistant mycobacterium abscessus. So uh, this is a young patient who had, he was uh, actually immunosuppressed, and he had this this mycobacterial infection. And uh, he was treated with a mycobacteriophage, which was developed by Graham, Graham Hatful and his colleagues in the C-phages program. So this is a program where high school students uh, isolate phages. So some of these phages in their collection turned out to lyse this particular isolate. They used it to treat the patient. Uh, the uh, the bacteria became resistant, and so they were re- they re-engineered the phage to overcome the resistance in the course of the treatment. Another interesting story. Uh, and then um, f- finally, development and use of personalized bacteriophage-based therapeutic cocktails to treat a patient with disseminated resistant Acinetobacter baumani infection. And um, this was a story in the news. This patient got sick uh, in, I think it was Turkey. He and his wife were there on vacation. Uh, His wife is here on the paper, Stephanie Strathdy. Um, And uh, she worked at a university. And they couldn't treat this this guy. He he was airlifted uh, back to the U.S. He was unconscious. They couldn't treat him. And she said, we have to find phage therapy. So she found all these phage therapy people, Rai Young, at Texas A&M and a a number of people at the Navy. And they found a a phage that killed this this isolate. They gave it to him and uh, he recovered. Now he's fine. He woke up. After 12 days of intravenous phage, he woke up out of his coma and now he's better. And his wife has written a book about it. (laughs) And we did a twiv at Texas A&M with some of the people involved in this, including um, Rai Young and Jason Gill were there. So that, that's very interesting. But Rai Young says, I get call, calls every day to treat someone, but we're not there yet. It's too early. This was a really interesting effect. It's great we saved his life, but it's not for everybody. And one of the problems is shown in this paper. Potent antibody-mediated neutralization limits bacteriophage treatment of a pulmonary infection. So again, this is from Graham Hatful. And this was now treating a immunocompetent patient who had a mycobacterium infection. And it was the, the ability of the phage to do that was limited by antibody responses made by the host. So that's something we are going to have to get over in immunocompetent patients. So it's not straightforward. It may be that therapy is limited to superficial infections, you know, skin wounds and so forth. And those are much easier to treat. But we'll see what happens. This is a rapidly emerging and developing field. Let's talk now about vectors um, uh, for, for the, the rest of the therapy that we're going to be using. One of the commonly used vectors is adenovirus, which all of you have now become aware of as a consequence of the pandemic because we are using them for vaccines. But these have been developed as vectors long before the, the current pandemic, which is why we could deploy them so quickly. As you know, adenoviruses are large, double-stranded DNA-containing Viruses, we know a great deal about their molecular biology, and our ability to make vectors depends on understanding all the obscure stuff I have tried to teach you in this course. So here's the DNA down here, 35,000 base pairs in length. We know how it works. We know what genes are encoded, and that led to the production of the first vectors. Now, adenovirus is a good candidate for gene therapy and for delivering genes or antigens via vectors because it efficiently affect, infects post-mitotic cells. And you should understand this right away. A post-mitotic cell means it's not dividing. And you should remember that adenovirus kicks cells into dividing so that its DNA can get reproduced. Um, very fast onset of gene expression. The virus remains episomal, minimal risk of insertion mutagenesis. We don't see this. And again, during this pandemic, people are always saying, is this going to insert in my genome? No, we never see that. 
big capacity. You could have almost the whole genome capacity. You can easily make pure concentrated preps. There are a lot of ser- human serotypes. There are animal serotypes, have you, as you have learned in this pandemic. Uh, so you can change serotypes if we need to. We always thought that immunity would be a drawback. And I'll show you an example of where it is a drawback, but apparently in the, in the current vaccine, COVID vaccines, it hasn't been an issue. So first-generation vectors uh, were deleted of the E1 and the E3 genes. So here's a schematic of the viral DNA with the inverted terminal repeats the packaging sequence here. You have to leave that in, right? Otherwise, the DNA won't get packaged. And they deleted E1 and E3. And you know that E1 encodes T antigens, which are essential, essential. Uh, and these T antigens antagonize RB and P53 to get the cells dividing. So we take it out of the vector, and so these are going to be non-replicating vectors, and it gives us some space for the transgene. But because it's essential to make the vector, you have to have a cell line that produces the E1 proteins. So you can grow the vector in that. And then the E3 are, encodes uh, immunomodulatory proteins. We don't need those. So this gives us some room for the transgene. The transgene is the word I use for what the gene you are putting into the vector. But this is a, has been a long evolving field. We made second generation uh, vectors. Uh, we delete E1 and E3 plus E2 or E4. You know, this is all from studies that show we can get rid of these other proteins uh, coding regions. And this gives us even more space for the transgene. Depends how big the transgene is that you want to put in, of course. Uh, and the third generation has reached the ultimate, and they are called gutless vectors because everything's been removed. We only have the two inverted terminal repeats and the packaging sequence. Uh, so everything in the middle is gone. So you could put a big, a big transgene in if you want. And uh, you need a helper virus, of course, uh, to, to package this. Uh, which will provide all the functions that are needed, including the capsid proteins. Because here, here is the vector here, for example, uh, where we have left inverted terminal repeat the packaging sequences and then the right inverted terminal repeat. So it's basically about less than a KB of viral DNA. And you put your transgene in here. There's a promoter in front of the transgene. So the, you have to be able to propagate this uh, DNA in cells and package it. So for that, you use a helper virus. And the helper is E1 deleted, so it doesn't uh, reproduce, right? It, uh, it doesn't end up in the vector preparation. So here's an example of how this is done. It's just incredibly clever approaches have been used to make these vectors. Here is the case where the helper adenovirus uh, has locks P sites flanking the packaging signal. All right, so now packaging signal, of course, is at the left end of the genome. Here's the vector DNA. Here's our helper virus DNA at the bottom. So it is almost full length. It's deleted for E1, so it will not reproduce and get and contaminate the vector. And to prevent it from packaging, right, because this helper is making capsid proteins to package the vector, but we don't want the helper to be packaged. We put these LOXP sites flanking the packaging sequence in the helper genome. Now, what is LOXP? Aha! <laughs> LOXP are sites that are cleaved by a nuclease called CRE. It's a nuclease system from bacteria. It's called the CRE LOX system. Yes, it stands for cream cheese and LOX. And... Um, the LOX is the specific sequence cleaved by the Cree nuclease. So you can uh, put these LOX P sites flanking the packaging sequences. You put both of these DNAs into cells that are producing not only E1 so that the helper virus will make more copies so that it makes a lot of protein, but they make Cree also. And so as the helper genome reproduces, uh, the packaging sequence is deleted so that those helper genomes are never packaged. So it's a little bit complicated, but I just give it to you as an example of the incredible, clever approaches that we can take when we have these tools. And we wouldn't have them if we weren't curious and just pursued our curiosity as scientists. We can't just 
do things that are d- dedicated to curing disease. When I made infectious polio DNA, I was just curious. I wanted to know if it worked, and then it had a benefit. When they discovered Crelox, they were curious, and it had a benefit. Same for almost every major discovery in science. Uh, next, we have adenovirus-associated virus vectors, and these are not satellites, right? We never called them a satellite, but... Um, Oh, by the way, on the latest tweet vote, Nels's pick was a paper describing a satellite of a virus that infects uh, flies, I think, and and, uh, makes their wings get bigger or something, or beat faster. I don't remember what, but it was the effect of the satellite. These are helper-dependent viruses. Small, single-stranded DNA-containing viruses with icosahedral shells Here's the, the odd single-stranded DNA with terminal repeats, encoding single capsid protein and um, protein, the rep protein, uh, which recruits the DNA synthetic apparatus of the host cell. So again, a virus whose molecular biology has been very, very worked at, well worked out. And here's how we make vectors from these. We take out the, most of the coding region for the rep and the cap proteins, right? The DNA recruiting protein rep and the cap. There are two inverted terminal repeats in the DNA at either end. And we insert a transgene. We put a promoter in front of it to drive mRNA expression. We then take this DNA and put it into cells, transfect it into cells in culture, along with plasmids that encode the helper functions needed to reproduce AAV, and these, in this case, they're from adenovirus. So that they include E1A, E1B, E2, E4, and VA. You need all of those DNAs from adenovirus to get AAV to reproduce. So you take the rep cap plasmid also, you put it in with the transgene because you want to package the AAV. So the rep cap will reproduce the, the viral DNA and it will make capsid protein. Helper functions allow the reproduction to occur, the DNA replication, and out comes recombinant AAV. Again, I just love this that our curiosity has led to this. So docs can take the recombinant AAV and give it to patients. But the scientists have sorted it all out in the previous years. Now, the there, there's some aspects of AAV that are very cool. And one is that the DNA seems to last a very, very years once it's put into cells by the virus. And so the DNA goes into the nucleus, right? The virus uh, enters the cell. The DNA gets in the nucleus where it would reproduce. Uh, and if you – adenovirus, AAV DNA can, in fact, integrate uh, into the host genome if there's no helper virus uh, present. But that requires the rep proteins, which are not made when you infect – a recipient with the recombinant AAV. There's no rep protein there. So the DNA will not integrate. So if you've heard about AAV integrated, it does when rep is present. But in the vectors we give people, it doesn't integrate, yet it still remains for years. And why is that? Well, it's because of an unexpected event, and that is when the DNA gets in the nucleus and begins to reproduce, it recombines and forms circular monomers and concatomers. Now you have a new word, concatomer, right? Um, And those look like plasmids. They're episomal, outside of the chromosomal DNA, and they stay there forever. They divide with the cell. And so this is why AAV gene therapy is so good. We'll talk about an example of that in a bit. The DNA lasts forever, so the protein, the therapeutic protein, can last, well, I don't know about forever because we haven't looked that long, but many, many years for sure. Time for a quiz question. All right, I'm supposed to stay on the slide, sorry. (laughs) Which technology is indispensable for the production of therapeutic viruses? X-ray crystallography, high-throughput genome sequencing, synthesis of infectious DNA copies of viral genomes, plaque assay immunofluorescence. You can only pick one, right? This is one of those easy multiple choice. The hard type is the multiple answers. But when there's one, you could rule them out. So you got to pick one of these. And while you're thinking about that, let's uh, check out some questions here. So we have now a tradition. We have a (laughs) pre-show, a 
pre-session. You know, in podcasts, we call it a pre-show. We talk, and uh, there's a lot of chat going on there, yeah. So let's get to the part where we, and you're all, you're all sad that it's ending, of course, and I am too, because I'll miss all of you, because it's a nice community that we have built here. But uh, every good thing ends, and um, as I'll be back. Well, I'm back uh, multiple times a week anyway. You can't get away from me. And um, I'll have another course in the future. Okay, here we go. Green lighting, that's when I came in. Wish I could have listened to every episode. I'm sorry, but they're all recorded, right? So you can go back uh, and listen to them. In fact, let me put up camera three on my big monitor so I don't have to look sideways. I have a big monitor in front of me at the incubator. And uh, I have a little one off to the side, which is running the stream, but I can put the stream uh, on the big monitor. So that's what I've done. So it looks like I'm looking at you. Green is my best color, you think? Uh, thank you. Purple or blue is complementary. I thought red was complementary to green. All right, you know the colors. I don't for sure. But uh, but on the last Twitter, Alan said red would be. So I could get blue or, or uh, purple. But maybe you mean, I'm talking about complementary in the color wheel sense, right? <laughs> it's a mutating background, right? Have it light that I can change the color, which I bought with your money. Wasn't that expensive, but I use your All of this here, uh, except for the books and the models, was bought with your support. And the whole studio here. And please visit sometime to see what we're building. It's not yet done, but I wanted to make this a highly professional studio where we make really, really good quality productions that where the Production doesn't interfere with the content. You're never distracted by echoes, which I've done often and so forth. I heard that a piece of HIV was used to deliver corrected genetic material for sickle cell. Yes, well, vectors, HIV, lentiviral vectors. Was, we'll talk about that today, actually. Patreon now adds sales tax to donations. Yes. Is there another way to make monthly donations? So you can use... Uh, PayPal, um, where you could set up a monthly donation. I don't think they, they charge sales tax. But if they do, uh, I have set up a Venmo account, and I have not yet put it on my website, but you could do that as well. So stay tuned. I need to build a donor page that's a little bit – well, I have a page, but I need to build one that incorporates new things like the 501c3. I haven't done that yet. Adding tax to a nonprofit. That's a good question. Maybe they shouldn't be. That means no. So that's two different things. I say I, I'm out of my I'm out of my league here. There's nonprofit and then there's tax exempt. Sales tax exempt. So I know Columbia doesn't pay sales tax when it buys things, right? So I don't know if I'm sales tax exempt. Some people have said I I have to look into that. <laughs> Uh, can we get a copy of that paper? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, let me put a put a PDF uh, on the on the course website. That would probably be the easiest way. Uh, CDNA paper PDF. Okay, that's a good idea. Does this class have a lab? If you take it in person, no, there's no lab uh, associated with it. <clears throat> which it would be nice to have one, but uh, every year one student wants to work in the lab, and uh, they, I have them work with Amy. And uh, this year we had a, a wonderful student, Edward, who uh, has helped us a lot. Unfortunately, he's graduating in the spring. But all good things come to an end, right? Uh, this isn't a COVID discussion, but tonight, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, Q&A with A&V. We'll talk all things COVID. Yeah, and Les, of course, responded as a great moderator that all of you are. 
Yes, and so yes, there have always been articles about phage therapy, but they don't catch on because the antibiotics have been much cheaper to make. But they get now they're hard, so we need alternatives. <laughs> when it's said that phage kills the bacteria, what's the bacteria fatality? Well, you can have almost all of them killed. It depends on the phage host uh, system. Some are not 100%. Others are close to it for sure. Can we synthesize phages for a particular bacteria? We find them in nature, right? You can always you can find phages in nature. For the, the mycobacterial phages are found in the soil. Um, so we, we have, and in fact, the Navy has huge collections of phages that are specific for many bacteria, and that's what you need. And so uh, this individual, uh, this course makes uh, Conquest want to study virology, and that's my goal, to get people really interested. And I wish more people would listen. I mean, I hear on a daily basis so many uninformed things said about viruses and virology. And it gets, and of course, it's worse in a pandemic because everyone's interested. And I just wish they would take the course. I know it's hard and it's a lot of time, but you're going to learn so much more. Yeah. What can you do? Slowly and surely. If viruses caused mutations that led to superpowers, what would be the most likely mech? I have no idea. But, there, you know, plant viruses change the organics of the plant to attract vectors so they can do cool things. I don't know what they do in people, right? Um, we, have, we accuse our microbiome of doing things, but the virome may do something. We don't know about it. It's hard to study, right? It's a cool thing when high school students get to isolate phages and name them. It was discussed on this a recent TWIV with the high school student virus hunters. Yeah, that was a cool episode. Thank you, Alden, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Were there any other approved adenovector vaccines before COVID? No, there weren't. There were experimental ones, for sure, which we've talked a little bit about. How are E1 and E3 deleted? Yeah, well... You do recombinant DNA. You take a cloned piece of DNA and you cut it. I mean, you can use a restriction enzyme or nowadays you can use PCR to delete exactly what you want. You could use primers that flank the deletion site and then you build it back into the full length. You can do anything you want with recombinant DNA. That's the beauty of it, right? That is the beauty of it and that's why infectious DNA is so cool. Um, but in case of E1, it's essential for replication. So you have to provide it, right? Do vector viruses mutate or retromutate? But in the host, they will not because they're not replicating. The DNA is just getting in for most cases. So there are some replicating vectors, but in most cases, they're non-replicating, so they're not going to mutate. I think a major limitation is the patient solicitator. Yeah, it's a, it was in the, the slide I showed you. Did you see it? Maybe you missed it. You came in later. Yeah, it's in the slide. There's an article about it. Yep. Cool early history of polynucleotide system. Yeah, H.G. Karana. Uh, he started out elsewhere, and he came to Wisconsin, and he had them name a bridge after him, right, um, that he used to walk across to get to campus. And there's a nice plaque in front of one of the buildings, which I saw on a, rec on a trip a couple of years ago. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I would imagine that there are some transgenes that are too big for AAV. Yes. It doesn't have a big capacity. Remember, the capsid was going to limit how much DNA you can put in it, for sure. Ah, I've been waiting for this question. When will the final exam be posted? I hope to get it up this weekend, okay? But since you're not going to see me anymore, nobody's going to take it, right? <laughs> no, I will put it up this weekend. Will the Wednesday evening Q&A continue? Oh, oh yes. We are, we're going to do this forever. I even when Amy gets a job and goes wherever she goes, um, we'll do it remotely. And it will change, right? Because there will be other outbreaks and other pandemics. We'll also do viruses in general. I'm hoping there will still be some people who come. So we'll be there, yeah. 
Can adenovectors use, be used for neurological diseases? Um, they could be, but it's you have to make sure they get in the CNS, right? So other virus, other vectors are better for that. Yeah. Um, now, when I do the uh, quiz, I don't set a timer because I just answer questions until uh, they run out, um, and I have to keep an eye on the clock because I have a hard out at one today. Do you think the viral proteins can transmit from one person to the other without the virion? I don't think so. You know, that's why there are viruses, because <laughs> they're good at transmitting. Yes, please join us on the Wednesday Q&A. In fact, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I guess you all have since you're here. But um, please subscribe. I mean, I think it's great we have over 100,000, but... I really want a million subscribers. I want to reach more people. Is CCC DNA of HBV the same ever? Yeah, that's the thing. They don't go away. That's right. The HBV closed circular DNA stays just like the concatenators of AAV. How are AAVs selected for different tissues? Well, you could modify the capsid so it binds to a protein on a different tissue. Uh, that's mostly done with adenovirus, though, and I'll talk about that for a bit in a bit. Um, you're arguing with Patreon. I think it's wrong. Um, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna follow up on the 501c3. Maybe they. Uh, I'm sure they don't know that, right? If Vincent turns members on, we could subscribe and gain access to special content. You mean on YouTube? Yeah, but YouTube takes. <laughs> YouTube takes money. Why do you have ITRs in both the helper and the transgene? Well, they're needed for reproduction of both, right? Thank you, Rob, for your contribution for the incubator. I really appreciate it. And let's stop there now. We'll make that our last one. We'll come back to that. Let's go to the quiz. So... 50 out of 51. You know, you guys are better than the, the Columbia students. <laughs> Most of you answer. The Columbia students don't. The answer is C, synthesis of infectious DNA copies. It should have been 100%. I mean, the others are important, but they're not indispensable. And if you can only choose one, that's the only thing. Plaque assay is important, but there are other ways to get around placking. Everything else you could get around, but... Infectious DNA, no, you can't get around that. You can use retroviruses as vectors. And you should understand this very well. If you take uh, plasmids and each of these colored, very colorful lines are designating different plasmids. So we have one plasmid, which we call the capsid plasmid, which encodes the gag pol. That is, the gag is the structural region, the pol is the polymerase, integrase, and so forth. Just those and you put those in cells, uh, you will actually have particles made. And then you also include an envelope plasmid. Now you have particles with uh, glycoproteins, but without the genome. There's no viral genome encoded in these plasmids. So you have MP particles. So that is an early discovery which enables all of this. And then at the bottom now, if you want to put a transgene in, you take your capsid plasmid, you take an envelope plasmid, and you take a transgene plasmid. And all, they all have promoters. And the transgene is what you want to incorporate. And now the transgene uh, will be incorporated only if you put the packaging sequence from the retrovirus, of course, into the transgene. You need the packaging sequence. Otherwise, the RNA will not be incorporated. So now you have a retrovirus with a foreign gene. This is defective because it doesn't have retroviral genes in it. It just has a foreign gene. But that's what you can use for gene therapy. Um, so... We have developed a number of different kinds of retrovirus vectors. There are Maloney le le murine leukemia virus based vectors. This is a mouse retrovirus that has been extensively studied. And then we make HIV 1 based vectors or lentiviral vectors. I think it's really amazing that we have, you know, we've basically gutted HIV 1 
and turned it in, into a scourge of humanity to, to a savior. Isn't that amazing? Um, and so we have vectors based on HIV-1. And why we do that is because uh, these uh, retroviruses can infect non-dividing cells. Uh, the MLV-based vectors will only infect dividing cells because it's then that the nuclear membrane breaks down and the DNA, the proviral DNA can get in. And so we have packaging plasmids uh, where we have the, the, the gag and the pull genes. This is what I called the capsid plasmid in the previous slide. And then we have the envelope uh, plasmids. And then what we call transfer plasmids or the transgene plasmids. You put your gene of interest in. And these have evolved in years since the first ones were done. Uh, now we make self-inactivating transfer plasmids. Um, we have minimal LTR sequences, and part of the uh, U3 in the LTR is deleted, and hopefully you remember that U3 is one of the sequences in the LTR, so that basically you cannot regenerate uh, LT full LTRs. The reason this was done will become apparent in a bit, but you know, the, the full LTRs have a promoter in each one, and so the right-hand promoter can activate neighboring genes, depending on where these vectors integrate. They all integrate, and that was a problem in one gene therapy study. So they developed after that self-inactivating transfer plasmids where they're much, much safer. And so this has been developed for both uh, Maloney-based vectors and lentiviral-based vectors, and the principles are all the same. Uh, so these... Retroviral vectors, uh, as I said, HIV is preferable because it infects non-dividing cells. You get long-term expression, obviously, because we have a provirus integrating into the cells. And so really, really useful. Um, up to 8 KB transgene inserts. However, you can get insertional mutagenesis uh, because the 3' LTR has a promoter, and for that reason, it's been inactivated. Uh, and uh, we can also pseudotype the virus. In other words, we use the glycoprotein of VSV instead of the retroviral glycoprotein. And this gives the virus a very broad host range. You know that term pseudotyping means putting a glycoprotein on a different virus. And so we use VSV glycoprotein to pseudotype these retroviral vectors. Pox virus vectors have also been developed. And as you know, we have a, had a very successful pox virus vaccine. And a virus called modified vaccinia virus Ankara was produced as an alternative smallpox vaccine. The original smallpox vaccine had, had a quite high level of side effects, uh, so they produced a, a, a version MVA, uh, and this is part of the U.S. strategic national stockpile. As I told you, we have enough doses of smallpox vaccine to immunize every American in case of a bioterror attack, and the virus used for that is MVA, so extensively studied. Uh, this is a replication-deficient virus. It, it was passaged in chicken cells. Uh, the vector that we're going to talk about was passaged in chicken cells uh, until it no longer reproduced in mammalian cells. There's an assembly block, so the virus gets into mammalian cells, Everything happens. You have gene expression, but there's no assembly into virus particles. So that's the replication deficient vector of MVA. It, you can grow it up in avian cells, and then when you put it in mammalian cells, it, it does gene expression, but it doesn't make new virus particles. So it's replication deficient. So this virus can be worked on under BSL-1, the lowest containment condition. It has large capacity. The genome is huge. Uh, and also we've modified other pox viruses, Canary pox virus, this is one of them. This is a virus. Again, it will reproduce in birds, but not in mammalian cells naturally. That's been used in some of the HIV vaccine trials. And the way you would put transgene in is you let cells do it for you. So you make uh, a vector. You, make, you take your transgene, uh, whatever gene you want to put in. So we, should, we have it in red here. Uh, and then you have a shuttle vector which is a plasmid that you can grow up in bacteria. And the purple sequences are sequences homologous to, say, the MVA genome. And they will direct recombination 
in a cell. So you take this plasmid, you transfect it into cell, you, you infect the cell with MVA, and the two DNAs will recombine and out will come recombinants with your transgene. And you can screen them very readily for the presence of the transgene, which is shown here in red in the viral DNA. And then that can be used uh, for whatever application. And we'll talk about applications of all of these in a bit. We have vesicular stomatitis virus-based vectors. You know this because some of the COVID vaccines, actually the one, <laughs> I think one tried by Merck early on was a VSV-based vector, which didn't work. Uh, VSV is a negative-stranded RNA virus with an enveloped particle, and the genome encodes a number of mRNAs, and one of them is the glycoprotein encoding mRNA. So what we can do is we can replace uh, the glycoprotein with a transgene, if it's a, if it's a glycoprotein, for example, um, uh, or we can add a transgene if we're adding a, um, say, antigen, we can add it in addition to the glycoprotein. But in this case, we're replacing the, the G with a transgene. Uh, we have, uh, the way you get recover virus is that you, you put four plasmids into cells, a plasmid encoding the viral N, P, and L proteins, and then a plasmid encoding the entire viral RNA in the plus sense into which you've inserted your transgene. Each of these plasmids has a T7 RNA polymerase promoter in it. And that, then that is going to be the site of transcription by T7 polymerase. And so what you do is you put these plasmids into cells, and then you infect the cells with vaccinivirus that produces T7 RNA polymerase. The polymerase will copy these plasmids and make RNAs, and out will come virus. So the RNAs will come out. They will initiate the infectious cycle, and you will get virus. And so this is a little more complicated than the polio story, right? This is... Polio, you just put a plasmid into cells. But this is what had to be done for VSV and other negative stranded RNAs. Uh, we also make flaviviruses vectors. Um, flaviviruses are plus stranded RNA viruses. A little easier because you can make transcripts from a clone DNA copy, just as with polio virus, and put those in cells and out will come virus. And so some of the early vectors used yellow fever virus genome, the vaccine strain of yellow fever, it, it, plasmid was made encoding that genome. And then, for example, the structural proteins, PRM and E, were replaced with those of dengue virus, and we immediately had a dengue virus vaccine because the attenuating mutations in that infectious yellow fever vaccine virus were elsewhere in the genome. And that is called dengvaxia. So it's essentially using the yellow fever vaccine backbone as a vector for dengue structural proteins. But recovering these viruses are, are straightforward. You put the plus-stranded RNA, which is made by in vitro RNA synthesis into cells. Now, more recently, um, people are developing what we call insect-specific flaviviruses. One of them is called Binjari virus, which you grow in insect cells. So you can make a DNA copy of those viruses. You can put in and this is, would be only for flaviviruses. You put in the, st the structural proteins of, say, Zika virus or whatever flaviviruses you want to make a vaccine against. And then you recover the virus in insect cells. So uh, here you do the transfection in insect cells. And then that virus will enter mammalian cells. Protein will be produced, but the virus doesn't reproduce because it's an insect virus. It doesn't reproduce in, in mammalian cells. And a number of experiments have shown that immunizing mice with Binjari vectors uh, grown in insect cells protect mice against Zika virus, for example. So that's a promising one. We also use alpha virus vectors. Alpha viruses are plus strand RNA viruses, uh, and we can encode, we can replace the structural protein genes with an antigen, for example. And again, it would have to be related to uh, an alpha virus in order to do this strategy. But again, we have insect specific alpha viruses that will propagate in insect cells, but not in mammalian cells, and therefore are safe. Uh, and these have also been shown to work in mice to protect them against disease. And finally, Newcastle disease virus vectors. This is one of the vectors being used for COVID vaccines at Mount Sinai Group recently uh, has announced their 
COVID vaccine where you, again, this is a negative stranded RNA virus, encodes multiple mRNAs. Uh, you typically insert the transgene between the P and the M genes uh, and retain the viral uh, glycoprotein, which is the HN protein. And you recover the virus in the same way as for VSV. You make four plasmids, NPL encoding plasmids, and then you uh, put your full-length plus-stranded RNA in the plasmid with the transgene, put those in cells with T7 polymerase-producing vaccinia virus, and out come Newcastle disease virus. So some of the licensed vaccines uh, that use these vectors are shown here. Ervibo is a Ebola virus vaccine. It, it, it comprises the glycoprotein from a Zaire Ebola virus in a VSV vector that has been used extensively in, in uh, African outbreaks. Denvaxia, as I said, is the structural proteins of dengue virus in the yellow fever vaccine vector. Uh, the yellow fever vaccine vector has also been used to produce a, a, a vaccine for Japanese encephalitis virus, which is used in humans, and a West Nile vaccine for horses. So these are licensed. Uh, the, the JEV is not licensed in the U.S. It's licensed elsewhere. Uh, a, a, vac a vaccine against highly pathogenic H5 avian influenza virus has been produced in the Newcastle disease virus vector. This is for chickens. It places where they're at risk for avian influenza, which can kill many chickens. This has the dual effect of immunizing the chickens both against Newcastle disease, which is a chicken pathogen, and avian influenza. So it's really cool. You do both at once. Of course, you all know that the AD26 uh, vector is part of the Janssen COVID vaccine, which is under EUA, not licensure in the U.S. Um, the Chadox 1 vector is a chimpanzee adenovirus vector, part of the Ast AstraZeneca Vaxevria vaccine, which is, has an EUA in the EU. And, the, and then we have AD5 and 26, human AD5 and 26 vectors uh, in the Sputnik vaccine produced in Russia by Gamalaya. And there, and there are others as well. This is not a comprehensive list, just to show you that now many of these are going into humans, spurred on by the pandemic, of course. There are also many experimental human vaccines using vectors, HIV vaccines uh, with AD5 vectors. There's an AD26 uh, Ebola virus experimental vaccine. Modified vaccinia Ankara has been used with uh, avian H5 influenza viruses, H HIV. This MVA was part of the uh, RV144 AIDS trial that I mentioned in the AIDS lecture. Uh, MERS vaccine, MERS coronavirus vaccine has been developed in an MVA backbone for camels. The idea would be not to give this to people, but for to camels because they're all infected, whereas few people seem to be uh, seriously infected. So you immunize the camels. It's a one health approach, just like the Hendra vaccine. AAV vectors are used in a variety of experimental vaccines, herpes viruses, human papillomaviruses, HIV, SARS-CoV. Uh, VSV is also being explored for a MERS coronavirus vaccine. And of course, then this was SARS-CoV up here for the AOV, CoV-1. And all of these platforms are, have been explored for uh, SARS-CoV-2 beyond what we've talked about today. All right, let's uh, talk about using viruses to treat monogenic diseases. And these are diseases caused by a mutation in one gene, and they're quite frequent. There are 6,000 different diseases that are caused by mutations in one gene, and they occur at a frequency of about one out of 200 live births. That's quite a lot. They are amenable to gene therapy. Viral gene therapy, you deliver a copy of the normal gene. Uh, and they are, there are obviously others that have more than one gene at risk or, or, or mutated, but here the, the concept has been explored using monogenic diseases. And this table gives you an example of the, some of the different, some of the 6,000 monogenic diseases that are amenable to gene therapy and, and that have been tried. And here's the disease, the defect, the incidence, and what vectors are being used. And so, for example, severe combined immunodeficiency. We have defects in antibodies, T cells, NK cells. You really have a problem. It can be caused by 
uh, defects in different genes, uh, and they're being uh, treated with retrovirus vectors, experimentally for the most part. Uh, various enzyme deficiencies, hemoglobinopathies, thalassemias, defects in hemoglobins, uh, factor IX deficiency, uh, anti one, alpha one antitrypsin. Here's uh, here are some blinding diseases: Leber's congenital amaurosis. This has actually been uh, FDA approved. We'll talk about that. Uh, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy is a neurological disease that can be treated with lentiviral vectors and and uh, Wiscott Aldrich. So, just some examples, and many trials are ongoing. He, these are uh, the g- clinical trials for for gene therapy. Uh, from 1989 to 2018, and you can see that numbers have generally increased. There have been a few uh, dips, and that has happened when we've had a problem, and I'll talk about some of the problems we have observed, uh, And um, but then it recovers as we fix the problem, as you can see here. Now, uh, here's a, a pie chart showing you what kinds of indications are addressed by gene therapy trials. I talked about monogenic diseases, so there, there are about, I think this is about 1,800 uh, trials summarized in this figure. So about 10% are monogenic diseases. Most of them are cancer, and we'll talk about that. You have infectious diseases, cardiovascular, neurological eye diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the adenovirus vectors seem to be the most used, at least in this figure, which is a couple of years old now. It may have changed. Uh, retroviruses are next. And we, then, then we have DNA in many trials giving naked DNA, vaccinia virus, AAV, lentiviruses, poxviruses, even herpes, et cetera. So how do you do this? How do you replace the gene? So there are two general ways. You can do direct delivery where you inject the vector into the patient. So you put your therapeutic gene into the vector. This is a lentivirus vector, and you inject it into the patient. Obviously, for vaccines, you would do this intramuscularly typically. That's what most of the vectored vaccines are delivered by or how they're delivered. Um, but if you were trying to do gene therapy, you might not do that. Uh, if you wanted to treat a liver disease, you might inject the vector intravenously because there it will go to the liver initially. And in, in fact, the liver will filter out most of the vectors. And so this is not an efficient way to do most uh, gene therapy. Uh, but the, the other way is to actually do it via stem cells. And so you take stem cells in culture, adult stem cells, which you can get from the blood. We can purify them from the blood. We now have embryonic stem cell lines that we can use, which can be uh, derived from embryos. You know, we can't do this anymore, but there are some approved lines derived from embryos. Uh, We can now do nuclear transplants to make them. We can also turn on any cell type into a stem cell by introducing plasmids. Uh, And then you culture those, you introduce your virus vector, you make sure the transgene is being produced, and then you reintroduce these cells back into the patient. And if they're stem cells, they can give rise to many cell types. You could do this, for example, with T cells, and we'll talk about an approach for uh, HIV therapy. So the earliest trials, uh, one of the earliest trials was in 1993 for cystic fibrosis, where this is a a disease where uh, the patients are typically have a deletion or a mutation of some sort in the gene encoding the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, which causes fluid imbalance in the lungs, thick mucus, and many opportunistic, many infections like pseudomonas infections. So the first treatment one was in a male with CF, uh, and they gave him uh, 2 times 10 to the 8th PFU of E1, E3 deleted ad carrying the gene for CFTR. And they put the, the virus right in the airway. You can see they've put a tube into the uh, this gentleman. There he is right there. Uh, they're putting a tube down into the lower recesses of the lung, and they spray the adenovirus in and then um, see what happens. And so this was he was given three administrations. So this is a transient uh, effect, right? The virus doesn't stay forever. And so we're looking at exog- exogenous versus endogenous protein, what was delivered versus what's there. And you can see there's a, a burst of vector uh, delivered uh, at the first dose and then a little bit less at the second. Then by the third dose, there's no more vector-delivered protein. And that's probably because of antibody to the vector prevented it from uh, expressing any longer. So this is why uh, I say we have 
could have immunology, uh, immunity issues. Uh, so this is one of the things that was learned uh, from this, these early trials. Uh, these are cells taken from the patient pre and post therapy. You can see staining for the CFTR. You, the cells are producing it. Uh, this patient had no effect, no positive effect on his disease. Uh, even though the protein was produced, he still had cystic fibrosis. So this is not the way to take care of this. So in the clinical trials proceeded, and unfortunately in 1999, there was a huge setback, uh, the death of a teenager, Jesse Gelsinger. You can find his father's uh, description of this online. So he and his father decided to enroll him in a trial. He had ornithine transcarbamoylase deficiency, an X-linked disease uh, that leads to accumulation of ammonia and glutamate in the blood. And these patients have a declining cognitive ability and premature death. Now, Jesse had a mild form of the disease, yet he, he volunteered because he wanted to contribute. And what they did was give these patients, and he, he was not the only patient in this trial. There were a number of other patients in this particular trial. Uh, it was done at the University of Pennsylvania. They gave them adenovectors with a normal uh, OTC gene. They were inoculated um, intramuscularly, sorry, by the right hepatic artery. Uh, and they had decided that the dose, well, they had done trials in macaques, and they said, okay, we're going to give uh, 17 times less virus than we did gave to the macaques. Um, and some of the patients had severe reactions uh, to the transgene. There was no clinic, <clears throat> excuse me, there was no clinical benefit but a number of them had uh, massive I inflammatory responses uh, to the vector. Um, he was the last patient in the trial. He got the highest dose of the vector, uh, and um, he died as a consequence of the inflammatory disease. Uh, he had uh, a massive inflammatory response, multiple organ failure. And more disturbingly, I mean, they had – this should not have been done. There were multiple rules of conduct broken at the university. All gene therapy trials were halted for a number of years. UPenn was severely criticized, and deservedly so, because the people running this were cowboys. They were trying to do things that they shouldn't have been doing. And I'll leave it to you to find a description of this online. But this was a blow to gene therapy, which, but it eventually dis recovered because it's an important approach if it's done correctly and with uh, the right oversight. So X-linked severe combined immune, immune deficiency, as I said, uh, the effect in TB and NK cells. And this is a, a map of the um, IL-2 receptor gamma chain gene. Uh, and all of these colored symbols are various uh, mutations that have been identified in the gene in patients with X-linked SCID. And so you have to correct this. This gene is defective. There's the transmembrane domain, for example. And so these, these changes are throughout the gene. <clears throat> so uh, two trials were done, one in London and one in Paris, pa Paris uh, where they gave infants a retrovirus with a normal gene, the IL-2 receptor gamma chain gene. So you have to do this at a young age, right, because many of these individuals will die of infections later on. So they take out bone marrow hematopoietic precursor cells, CD4, 34 positive. Uh, nowadays, you can get these from the blood. Infect with the vector, put them back in the patients. Four out of nine infants in Paris, and by the way, the treatment worked. <laughs> it cured their skid. But four out of nine infants in Paris and one in London developed T-cell leukemia three to six years after treatment. Those cancers were treated successfully with chemotherapy. So the, the, the infants... Uh, were no longer infants, obviously. They were okay. But as a consequence, 27 trials with retroviral vectors were halted, and the vectors were redesigned based on the findings. And what they found was these vectors inadvertently inserted uh, near oncogenes. Uh, and here, is, here are two different insertion sites. They sequenced the genome of the patients, and they found the vectors integrated in these two areas. Uh, and activated this gene LMO2, uh, which is uh, a gene that's abnormally activated in, in some childhood leukemia. So its overproduction causes leukemia, and that's what happened here. 
the integration activated the transcription. Uh, the one in the opposite sense, probably by enhancer uh, effects of the uh, of the uh, vector. But uh, so the vectors, as I said, were redesigned to get around this, and now we don't have these problems any longer. Uh, so this trial, uh, another trial was subsequently done uh, with modified vectors. Here's one lengthy viral gene therapy combined with low dose busulfan in infants with skid. Uh, eight infants given bone marrow transplants with uh, the gene and a lentivirus vector, and after 18 months, they all had functional B and T cells. So this is a success story. This works, and they didn't get any kind of cancer. And someone asked about sickle cell disease. This has been in the news th this week, and in fact, I took uh, this slide from uh, this this image from one of the publications. Uh, sickle cell disease is caused by an abnormal form of uh, beta globin. The gene has a has a mutation in it, the protein is altered. The, the, original, the original figure from the journal didn't have altered here. That's my word because they used the wrong word. It's not M, it's altered. And the, the consequence is that your red blood cells sickle and they don't work well. So you can uh, deliver a functional copy of the beta globin in a lentivirus vector. Uh, you can transduce stem cells, for example, with these. You will have normal uh, beta globin produced, and this has shown promise in clinical trials. I mean, a, a future approach might be to replace the gene with CRISPR-Cas9. So uh, you could cut out uh, the defective version and replace it with a wild-type version of the hemoglobin gene. You can do that with CRISPR-Cas9 delivered using lentiviral vectors into stem cells and uh, achieve the same effect. Uh, I'm not sure which one would be preferable. It seems to me that it's simpler to deliver uh, the normal gene and maybe you'd still have a fraction of uh, abnormal cells. I don't know. But anyway, that's an example uh, that's ongoing now. <clears throat> we can also correct a variety of blinding conditions. These are called inherited retinopathies. They're common, they're untreatable, and they're caused by s mutations in a single gene that encode either retinal photoreceptors or retinal uh, components of the retinal pigment epithelium. So uh, here is a schematic of the retinal pigment epithelium, the epithelium at the back of your eye, right, where it captures light and converts it to electrical signals. And uh, that's done by a series of nerves, cones, and rods, uh, which synapse with each other and eventually uh, the nerves go into the optic centers of the brain. And each, there are mutations in genes in each of these components that have been found to be uh, present in people with different blinding conditions. So for example, uh, these separate boxes on the table are attempts to restore the normal gene that's defective in the retinal pigment epithelium, the cones and the rods, the Muller cells, even in the ganglia and th different kinds of vectors that have been used. These are all different therapy trials using AAV vectors, uh, using lentivirus vectors, and using uh, adenovirus vectors. And these are first tested in animals, of course, and then into humans. And AAV vectors have been the most promising so far uh, in terms of restoring sight and Longevity. Even though the lentiviral vectors have longevity, they don't work as well as the AAV vectors. And one of these um, diseases is called Leber congenital amaurosis. It has a mutation in the RPE65 gene uh, in the retinal pigment epithelium. It encodes a protein needed for photoreceptor function. In dogs, a single subretinal injection of the vector with the canine wild-type gene restores seeing in the dog. And so you actually put a needle containing the vector into the eyeball and you inject the virus into the uh, retinal pigment epithelium. That's how the, the delivery works. And so in dogs it worked and it was subjected to clinical trials in humans. And it was approved by the FDA in December 2017. The drug is called Luxturna. And uh, the, the, the other name is uh, Voretigine Neparovec. Wow. Uh, and uh, first gene therapy approved in the U.S. to target a disease caused by mutations in a specific gene. And one of the drivers in this is Catherine High, who uh, used to be at UPenn, and uh, she's now 
moved to her company that uh, is, that does this, but I interviewed her on TWIV 350. Really uh, interesting chat with her. Some other gene therapy trial successes. SCID, we mentioned, adenosine deaminase, Liber. By the way, the cost for Luxturna is $895,000 for two eyes. And that's a lot of money. And the company says, you know, how much is it worth for you to be able to see? I mean, obviously they want to recover their costs. But I don't know. If the insurance pays for it, I suppose. This is a problem to me, these kinds of prices. Hemophilia, beta thalassemia, lipoprotein lipase. And here's the most expensive drug ever. Avexis is an AAV9 carrying the spinal motor neuron 1 gene, and the disease is biallelic spinal muscular atrophy. A treatment will cost you $2.125 million, which is a lot of money, but again, this is a, this is a serious disease. Uh, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I think it's just unfortunate that these have to be so expensive and that the companies essentially say, what is your life worth to you? Our next question, let me go and turn it on. Which of these viral vectors are not likely to be compromised by immune memory in human? Newcastle disease virus, vaccinia virus, herpes simplex virus, adenovirus. And let's, let's go back to your questions here. All right. <laughs> Ian has to sleep. Uh, thank you, Ian, for coming and for your support. See you another time. So do you think phage therapy will boom? So there are problems associated. It's not straightforward. It's not a slam dunk. You have to design the therapy for the patient. And, and immunity is an issue. And so it may be limited to certain kinds of infection. I think it's going to be a while before we sort it out. I have no doubt that we'll be using phages for therapy of infections, but what kinds remain to be seen? Jimmy Genome has a background in genomics and arthropod vector. I have never taken a virology course. So, well, good. I'm glad you took this one. I think it's a really good one. I've been teaching it a long time, and I've been studying viruses for a long time, so it's a perfect combination. I'm glad you liked it. If uh, mitochondria are originally of bacterial origin, are there phages that could affect them? No, but there are mitochondrial viruses that probably came in with the bacteria many, many years ago, right, and, and have remained. But I'm not aware of any that would now, a phage that would infect them now. How long will the final be up? I'll leave it up for uh, a month or so, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer, for your contribution to the incubator. Thank you, Keith, for your contribution. Thank you, Marie, for your contribution. Really appreciate your support. As I say, I want to build something unique here and make it into something that endures. Uh, so Mark wants to know the, the J&J uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. I, they're, I don't believe they're gutless. They have other components, but I'm not sure offhand. I'd have to look in the materials. Those are readily available. You can find that. Any method can help generate novel viruses to target specific tissues. Yes, you can. We've talked about that on TWIV, actually, um, modifying adenovirus-associated vectors. You have to find antigens on the tissue that you want to direct them to, and then you can do it, yeah.
Why didn't the VSV vector? I'm not sure uh, what was the story with the Merck, but they canceled it, and I really didn't investigate it any further. Why would you ever use anything other than MVA since it's larger than – well, if you don't need a larger, you, you don't use it, right? And, you know, pe people tend to work with what they're familiar with. And so, you know, the Oxford group developed Chadox as a vector and they ran with it. They didn't work on MVA. They decided adenovirus is, have, induces good T-cell immunity, for example, and they wanted to do it. But – Sure, you could use MVA, and it's certainly used in other trials, but if you don't need such a big insert, you might not need to. Uh, what modifications need to be made for Lentivector to have a narrow tropism? So you'd have to um, use a glycoprotein with a specific tropism, right? So VSV glycoprotein, in fact, can attach to all cells. So that's a broad tropism. So you just find a narrow one, and uh, put it in. Depends on what tissues you want to target. No, so the the VSV. If you're going to replace the VSV glycoprotein, right? Uh, and you want it to get into cells, yes, it has to be glycoprotein. So the Ebola vaccine replaces VSV glycoprotein with the Ebola glycoprotein. The COVID VSV based replaced it. Yeah. So if you don't have a glycoprotein that's going to attach to receptor, you either have to add the antigen separately and leave the VSV glycoprotein in place or do something else because otherwise the virus won't attach to cells, right? Why not make modified SARS-CoV-2 as a vector? Well, it's... Uh, you could in theory, but you know all these other vectors have had so much more development over and many years of development, and they I think they're adequate. There's no clue that this would be any better. Um, but of course, if you're making an attenuated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, that's basically it. And if you have that and it works, then you could use that as a vector in the future. Yeah. AZ was never licensed. No, uh, the slide said EUA only European Union. It's not licensed in the U.S. Although Sarah Gilbert told me that. It should be at some point. Does AV have any downsides associated with adenovirus like clotting? So I'm not aware of them. The adenovectors, of course, bind platelet factor four, and they've always been known to do that. So that needs to be modified, actually. Uh, that should be actually a part of this lecture in the future. Ad vector. Let me write that down because I think modifying the ad vectors so they don't bind PF4 would be really important, right? Not that anyone would notice. I, I, I'm, I'm the professor. I would notice, man. The students can't sneak out of my classroom because the doors are at the front. Polio vaccine can revert to polio, cause be neurovirulent, one mutation, that's correct. How many changes in other vectors would be needed? Well, I, I think we'd need to talk about what vectors you're talking about because it, it would differ for each one. But you know, if, you're, if you're talking about a replication incompetent vector, um, I, I think that's very hard. The adenoviruses are deleted of all the genes needed, so that couldn't revert, for example. What makes H HEC 293 so good? At, they take up DNA really well uh, because they're defective in DNA response pathways. The innate responses to DNA are defective in those cells. And you know, they don't replicate, so they can't revert. But the insect-specific viruses do replicate. So the question is, would they ever be able to acquire changes needed, but they're not even replicating. So without replication, you can't have mutation, right? Oh, hello, Vanity. Welcome. Thank you for moderating today. Why are antibodies to the vector not an issue? I don't know. I was surprised to see that. That's why they made Sputnik a two-vector vaccine in part, but 
Apparently not, and I don't know why it's not an issue. I wonder if the rise of mRNA vaccines would swing quite a bit of the research. No, I don't think so. I don't th because everyone is not doing mRNA, and I don't think it's going to work for everything. Did the retroviral vector integrate close to LMO in all four? I think those were just two of the four. I don't know if they looked at the other two or not. I don't know what the story is there. And so uh, the uh, spinal muscular G therapy adenovirus AAV vector, yeah, 2.6 million, yeah. I don't know what others think, but I think what can be charged is very different to what should be. I agree. I agree. Show some humanity. I thought you were going, Ian. <laughs> I, I show some humanity, but not just for profit, right? Show some humanity, for gosh sakes. And there are obviously some uh, emotions about that. I would like the address of the incubator. Uh, so I'm having an issue with mail. For some reason, the post office doesn't think I exist. And a few people have had mail bounced back for b being undeliverable. I don't know why. I'm here. So if anyone knows what I have to do to get it fixed, let me know. So I could give you my home address, Rima. Just email me. I, you probably already did. Thank you, Pete, for your contribution. And I love your mug, which we saw last time, yeah. Thank you, Tom, also for your contribution. And we'll hold it there for the rest. Let's get back to the quiz. Only 43 out of 60. Did I, did I show the results? What happened here? Didn't give an answer. Anyway, the, for some reason, it didn't show a green, but Newcastle disease virus is the right answer. Maybe I didn't have it in the quiz. Uh, that's an animal virus. It's not likely that humans are going to have been exposed, whereas vaccinia, less likely vaccinia, but more humans will be, you know, immunized. Herpes, of course, adenovirus, so Newcastle disease virus, yeah. And I didn't turn on the slide as I did that. I'm very sorry. So Newcastle disease virus is the answer. All right, let's talk about, uh, finally, a viral oncotherapy destroying tumors with viruses. We use viruses that are animal viruses, non-human, that happen to replicate in tumors, like myxoma, Seneca Valley virus, and not human viruses, but people just discover that they reproduce in tumors. Or we can modify viruses to target and kill tumors, and we use immune enhancement. That's a very important part of it. And I did, uh, Linda Collin, actually, uh, did a short video on cancer-killing viruses. She worked on the Chadox vector at Oxford many years ago. Now, uh, early studies showed that vir viruses apparently had an effect on cancers. Even before we standardized clinical trials here, a number of studies showed that viruses could affect cancers. For example, here in 1949, they uh, used what they called hepatitis virus to treat 22 patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. There was some hint that vi people with virus infections did better with cancer, so they tried these. I mean, these weren't proper clinical trials. They were just, let's see what happens. And in this one, all this is is material from patients that had hepatitis. We didn't even know what kind of hepatitis it was. Um, 14 of these patients got hepatitis. It was one death. Horrible. Here we have using West Nile virus 
to treat various cancers in the 50s. Uh, severe encephalitis in 10 of the patients. I mean, these are wild-type viruses. Epstein-Barr virus was used. Uh, some patients got mono. And adenovirus, there was transient tumor necrosis. So there's some indication that you know, these had some effect. But, of course, now we move to the modern era where we do clinical trials properly. None of these would have been permitted uh, back then. And, in fact, I have to point out to you that uh, these people who got encephalitis from West Nile, that's why West Nile is a BSL-3 pathogen to this day, even though it's mosquito-transmitted. We now understand that uh, there are common properties of cancer cells that uh, facilitate the reproduction of viruses. These are called cancer hallmarks, like immortality, sustained growth, uh, resistance to suppressors, apoptosis, angiogenesis, impervious to immune defenses, met metastasis, and so forth. And we have found viruses that reproduce better under certain conditions, like adenoviruses in, in immortal cells, for example. And each of these shows you the different vectors that we use, adenoviruses, um, retroviruses, vaccinia viruses, VSV, Newcastle disease, measles virus, even uh, picornaviruses uh, are selected to match uh, some of these properties. Cancer cells typically have interferon defects. If by, we know by studying them in vitro and we know by sequencing the cancer genome tumors from patients. Now, there are over 2,000 cancer genomes sequenced. We know they have interferon defects, and that's one of the reasons why cancer cells uh, don't get eliminated. And so what we do, and that, of course, facilitates viruses to reproduce in them. And it's one of the reasons why viruses kill tumors, because there's little of an interferon defense in the tumor cell, and viruses are not, not checked whatsoever. But we've actually taken advantage of that by altering the interferon antagonists in these viruses. So in adenoviruses, herpes, vaccinia, VSV, we know the genes that antagonize interferon. So we take them out. It doesn't affect the ability of the virus to reproduce in cancer cells because the cancer cells have a reduced interferon response anyway. And these are examples of that. But what it does is it prevents the vector from reproducing in normal cells. So it's one way of making the vector specific to cancer cells because in a normal cell, the interferon response is going to inhibit virus reproduction. We can also use other ways to target vectors to tumors. For example, the measles virus hemagglutinin has been altered to recognize tumor markers. There are new proteins in tumors that are not found in other cells. They're called neoantigens. Nothing to do with the matrix. They are neo because they're new. Why are they new? Because tumor cells are mutating like crazy. And so you have new proteins produced, new antigens that aren't found in cells. And if you can identify them, you can target vectors to them. And we've done that with the measles vector. We've done it with herpes simplex virus. We can modify the glycoprotein to recognize uh, proteins found on tumors. Adenoviruses have been modified. We can... We can uh, we can change the fiber, which is the receptor attachment protein, to recognize neoantigens. And also, uh, we can, uh, we, well, we do that a lot with adenovirus. We also do post entry targeting. This is very clever, also. So, here we have two examples of positive and negative. So, in positive, we design the vector with a promoter that doesn't work in normal cells, only works in a tumor cell. So if the virus vector gets into a normal cell, nothing happens. If it gets into the tumor cell, the promoter works, reproduction occurs, and you have tumor killing. That's positive targeting. And we have negative targeting where we insert the target for a microRNA into the vector genome. Remember, microRNAs are produced normally in cells, and they target their target sequence and cause it to be degraded. So what you do is you find a microRNA that is not in your tumor, but it's, ev it's everywhere else. And so in other cells, in non-tumor cells, the target is going to be degraded by microRNAs in those cells, and the vector won't replicate. But in the tumor cell, there's no microRNA, so the vector reproduces. 
And this is just the northern blot, a, a gel showing you microRNAs, two different microRNAs, LET7A and MIR-124A. And these are RNAs extracted from different cells and tissues. And you can see that microRNAs aren't necessarily everywhere. So here's a tumor, Entera2, that doesn't have either LET-A or MIR-124A. So you might want to use that. Uh, it is it, LET7A is in all other tissues on this blot anyway, so that might be a good one to put in. We also do what's called arming the vectors. It's hard for these viruses to kill 100% of cells in a tumor, right? It just, just doesn't reach all of them. But what you do is you introduce genes into the vector that will help kill neighboring cells by, next to the ones infected. It's called that bystander killing. So we, we insert, for example, prodrug convertases. What's a prodrug? Acyclovir is a prodrug. It has to be activated by thymidine kinase. And so you could put the thymidine kinase gene in your vector, and then uh, it would activate the drug only in the tumor cells in which it's infecting. And then the, the drug would kill the cell. We also introduce genes encoding ion transport proteins, immunostimulatory factors to attract immune cells to the tumor because you want to also get the immune cell to recognize the tumor and start killing it. And so um, here are some examples of uh, the use of these vectors to kill tumors. Myxomavirus is a vector that's being explored. It's the same virus introduced into Australia to kill rabbits. Uh, it does not replicate in non-rabbit hosts, i.e. humans, but it turns out to infect cancer cells. So this is only something you would find by looking. Yeah, it doesn't infect people, but hey, maybe it'll infect our tumor cells. So they looked, and it turns out to infect cancer cells, probably because there's um, poor interferon response and cell pathways are activated related to transformation that are beneficial for the virus. And so what is being done is to try and treat tumor cells uh, in, a, in a variety of cases. These are different cancers that are being studied, human cancers being studied in animal models, and treating the, the cancers with a, a, a myxomavirus vector, uh, either in culture or in, in the animal itself, uh, and seeing if you can destroy all the tumors. So for example, here is a acute myeloid leukemia where you um, inject the cells into a, an immunocompromised mouse. The tumors grow. You can take this, the tumors out and treat them and put them back in the animal and show that most of the mice are free of the tumor. Uh, in this case, with multiple myeloma, you can get 100% of mice free of tumor cells. So the idea is, in people, if you have a, a cancer of some kind, sometimes you want to ablate the bone marrow. First, you take out a sample of bone marrow, give them lethal chemotherapy or radiation to kill all the tumor cells, which would also kill the bone marrow, and then put bone marrow back. But you don't want to put bone marrow back that has cancer cells in it. And so the idea would be to infect those bone marrow cells in culture with these, with these uh, myxomas and put back tumor cell-free bone marrow. And so that's why these kinds of studies are promising. You can get 100% of mice free, and you can even infect mice with various human tumors, again, implanted in the mice, and get 100% survival when you give them uh, the chemotherapy. So this is being explored for various human tumors. Another virus that's uh, used is measles virus. It turns out that the vaccine strain, the attenuated vaccine strain, preferentially replicates in tumors uh, because the vaccine strain during its attenuation uh, developed an inability to antagonize STAT1 and MDA5. So STAT1 and MDA5, part of the interferon system. Uh, they've introduced into this virus the gene encoding the human sodium iodide symporter. So that is a transport molecule. Here it is, NIS here, uh, that uh, will swap ions. And so then when they treat patients, they give them gamma-emitting isotopes so that they can see the virus reproducing in the tumor. So here's the radioactive iodide. It's taken up into the tumor only by the symporter that's expressed by the vector. And these isotopes, if you use a beta-emitting isotope, it will induce radiation poisoning. And these Symporters will allow them to get into the tumor cell because they're produced uh, by the vector. And uh, a very well-known study was done in two patients with multiple myeloma. This is a cancer of, of B cells. 
where your B cells become clonal. And here, here are um, flow cytometry scans to show the disease. And multiple myeloma is not only effect sh shown in the nature of the B cells, but also th these patients can develop tumors. So here's a patient. These are uh, scans of the of the skull, and you can see this patient has a a mass on the on the skull here. Uh, and that's a tumor, a multiple myeloma tumor. Uh, so these two patients didn't re respond to any other treatment. You know, they were going to, going to die. So they were given 10 to the 11th particles intravenously of this measles virus vector. So here is the scan of their um, their B cells. And you can see uh, normal plasma cytoma cells, antibody secreting cells, are here. And then you have clonal plasma cytoma cells, which are the cancer cells. Uh, and you don't want to have these clonal cells. They're tumor cells. But this one patient, after treatment, post-measles virus, you can see most of the clonal PCs were gone, uh, and also in patient two. So the, it, it did successfully remove. In fact, one of these patients had complete remission of the disease, gone after this treatment. And, the, and this mass on the skull also went away. Herpes virus has been approved uh, for the treatment of myeloma. In 2015, the, the virus, the vector is called imligic. Talamogene laherparavec. No, laherparavec. Tvec. It is uh, herpes virus modified to have the gene for GMCSF, which stimulates granulocyte production in macrophages to help kill the tumor. We've deleted uh, genes that cause tumor specific replication. We delete ICP 47 which would normally inhibit antigen presentation, but we want antigens displayed because then the CTLs will kill them. And after phase three for melanoma, where they inject this into the tumor, 16% uh, response, and so it was licensed. So it's not a big, you're not gonna live forever, but it will improve your life, and so this has been licensed. Uh, Vaccinia virus is also being explored by a company called Generex in honor of Jenner, JX594. Uh, this one, they've put the gene for GMCSF in. They've deleted the thymidine kinase gene, which makes the virus not reproduce in normal cells, but in tumors, they have elevated TK, so the virus will reproduce there. And this was an idea where they said, let's give this intravenously, not injected into the tumor, because many tumors are metastatic. There are simply too many to inject. But if we deliver it intravenously, will it reach the tumors? And so they took 23 patients with all sorts of advanced uh, treatment refractory tumors of different tissues, and they gave them this intravenously. And here is a, um, a stain showing presence of the vector. So these patients on the left were given PBS, the control, and on the right, the vaccinia virus. And you can see... Uh, colorectal cancer picked up the vector, endometrial cancer, colon cancer here. And so the virus was able to re replicate in half of the tumors of the patients and half of them had anti-tumor activity. So it's a proof of concept idea that you could design a vector to be given in the blood and it would reach uh, the tumor. An example of arming vectors with prodrug convertases. These include thymidine kinase. It would convert gancyclovir to gancyclovir triphosphate or cytidine deaminase, which would convert 5-fluorocytosine to 5-fluorouracil. These are nucleoside analogs. They would stop the DNA replication of the tumor cell. And so you would give the patient, say, gancyclovir, which is a prodrug, and then in the tumor cells, the production of TK, for example, by the vector would allow conversion of that to the inhibitory triphosphate, and that would then kill neighboring cells. It wouldn't require having uh, the vector in all of the cells. So again, the idea that the virus can't kill all the cells, let's give it an ability to give a drug that will enable other cells in the tumor to be killed. And TOCA511 is an example of that. This is a retrovirus vector armed with cytosine deaminase. Uh, this is for uh, patients with brain tumors. The virus is injected right into the brain. The patients are then given uh, either 5-fluorocytosine, either IV or right into the tumor. The uh, enzyme is made in the tumor cells by the vector. It converts TOCA 
uh, FC to 5-FU, and that kills the tumor cells. And it will just kill the cells and not other cells in the body because only the, the uh, cytosine deaminase is produced in those cells. And even picornaviruses have been repurposed to kill tumors. Here's an example of taking the vaccine strain of poliovirus, the Sabin strain. They take the internal ribosome endrocyte, the 5' prime non-coding region from a rhinovirus, and this virus turns out uh, to preferentially infect glioma cells, not neurons. And the, and the, the tumor cells apparently upregulate the, the poliovirus receptor that helps the virus get into them. It was given a phase 2 and in 61 patients for glioma, and it increased median survival uh, by about a month. Um, I'm not sure what the future of this is because, of course, once polio is eradicated, you can't be using these vectors, but uh, we'll see. Uh, so those are just some examples of different approaches. I think within 10 to 15 years, we will be treating most human cancers with viral vectors. I think it's that promising. But I want to leave you with this idea that therapeutic efficacy of these treatments is not just virus killing cells, but the viruses activate the anti-tumor immune response. So here we have a cancer cell. Our oncolytic virus is getting in. It's killing the cell, but the cell is also releasing antigens, which as you know, can be taken up by antigen presenting cells. And that can, and the, if these are neoantigens, that will lead to uh, recruitment of CD8 cells and CD4 cells which will all be producing cytokines to recruit more of an immune response. And so that's the idea that the vector not just kills cells, but it also attracts immune attention. And that the combination of the two is what gets rid of uh, the tumor. And for our last question of this course, which of the following statements about oncolytic viruses is incorrect? A, infection by oncolytic viruses leads to destruction of tumor cells only at the site of virus inoculation. B, some viruses of non-human animals can reproduce selectively in human tumor cells. C, viruses with both DNA and RNA genomes can be developed as oncolytic agent. D, various mutations in viral genomes that confer Tumor selective reproduction eliminate or impair viral gene products that counter host interferon defense. So which is wrong? And as you're looking at that, let's go back to some questions. <laughs> Would I be amenable to a bonus uh, virus ecology? So... Because I had to cancel one class, we didn't have a virus ecology lecture. So if you're interested, I, I could give that, vir that lecture in the new year. We'll schedule it for some uh, Monday. But you need to tell me if you're interested. I know Vanity's interested. But what about the rest of you? Would you like to see that? So if you want to send me an email, you should send it to vincent at microbe.tv. I would prefer not to get it at Columbia. I mean, you can find my Columbia email easily, but I'd like to keep it separate for administrative purposes. It's just easier. Vincent at microbe.tv. What's happening with uh, research on the human virome? So people are looking at it. It's hard to, to, to know what it means, right? People are looking. We know the human viral. We're looking at how it changes in health and disease. But we don't know what it means because we can't change it experimentally. So it's going very slowly. And I gave you some example of, of what work has been done in mice. And I think that's what we're going to have to do for some time. But as things come out, we'll cover them on TWIF. So you should keep following TWIF for sure. Would tumor markers be personal? It should to a certain extent, right? Um, but then there are also common ones that uh, you could use because you, you, you'd have to do that. Although, you know, in, in CAR T-cell therapy, which we'll talk about, uh, it can be personalized, yeah. How does it help to kill the bystanders? Well, they're not, those are tumor cells that are not infected initially, so you kill those, right? That's the idea. 
Uh, cancer can be mitigated by lowering angiogenesis. That's true because tumors increase angiogenesis, right? Because they're big, massive cells, and the ones inside need to get blood, so they stimulate the production of red of uh, blood vessels. I'm not aware of viruses modulating that. That's a good question. Would it be possible to treat Fourier's gang Fournier's gangrene with phage therapy? Uh, it's, I think, in theory, um, it is one of the, again. If it's uh, inside the body, if it's visceral, then it's harder because you have the immune response. But in theory, it could be done, and I wouldn't be surprised if, this, if it isn't being looked at. <laughs> Can you show us the view from the incubator window? Uh, I can't now because the ones here in my studio are are closed with uh, soundproofing. But uh, if you guys decide you want an ecology um, uh, lecture, I'll have a camera set up in the other room. I have two parts of the incubator. There's the recording area, and then there's a little office area. I have a window in the office, so I'll do it there. But it's, uh, it's a view of 7th Avenue in New York. It's pretty cool. Must patients treated with therapeutic viruses be isolated? Uh, no, they are, in, in general, not a, a threat to uh, other patients. So, for example, the measles is a, is a vaccine. Um, but I think normal isolation procedures in a hospital, not, you know, in these trials, they don't necessarily do that. Um, but many of them are defective, right? Okay, a lot of you would like ecology, so we'll have a, uh, a postscript, right? All right, good. Thank you, Holm, for your uh, contribution. Really appreciate it. What are the advantages of using viral vectors rather than mRNA? So you know that Moderna started as a company to use mRNA to treat cancers. And it, I'm not sure it was going so well. So uh, the vectors take uh, advantage of the normal property of viruses to kill cells, right, which the mRNA is not going to do, which is not to say that maybe a combination won't work, but I suspect that these companies will go back to that once we're done here. Thank you, Kathy, for your contribution. Glad you have learned. Uh, that one question, I hadn't, um, I guess I didn't put the answer in into the software, so I, but I told you what the answer was. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's take a stop there and go back to uh, the quiz and see what we got. Show results. Okay, now it worked. Infection by oncolytic viruses leads to destruction of tumor cells only at the site of inoculation is not true. Most of you got that. Um, um, right, you can do intravenous and the virus will get into tumors. Or if you put it in a tumor, it can spread to distal parts of the tumor that were not inoculated because of the bystander effect. Okay, so let me finish that up now before I leave. Finish this activity. You see, the, uh, I, you're not seeing this, but uh, I forgot to do this. This is what it looks like. I get the results, see? But I don't know who you are because you don't put names in. But some of you get 100, and some of you get 50, and some of you get zero. So, <laughs> All right. Last thing I want to tell you about is uh, CAR therapy, cancer immunotherapy using CAR T cells. But you can also do CAR macrophages, CAR NK cells. Uh, this has been approved by the FDA in 2017. And what it does is it modifies your T cells so that they now recognize a tumor antigen. So you have produced a chimeric antigen receptor by piecing together parts of different molecules. Uh, you put together uh, a, a, a transmembrane and signaling domain from a 
protein normally on the T cell, the, the cytotoxic T cell that would say recognize uh, a tumor cell, and then you combine it with a single chain antibody that recognizes a neoantigen or a tumor antigen. So what you do is you harvest T cells from the patient, and then you deliver this molecule, the CAR, via a lentivirus vector in culture. Then you put the T cells back in the patient, and now they have the ability to kill tumor cells by virtue of having this new targeting element on their surface. So this is uh, highly promising, and it depends on viral delivery by lentivector. So that's why I wanted to, to mention it to you. So I want to end this by reminding you that all of this today has been made possible by basic research. Fundamental advances in virology, recombinant DNA, uh, immunology, clinical science, much of which we have talked about in this course. So there always has to be a balance between translational research and basic research, which means translational research, cure a disease, and basic research, Here's a good scientist, give them some money and let them pursue their curiosity and good things usually happen. And most people don't get this. They don't get why we're studying phages or worms. Remember a famous politician who said, why are we studying worms and flies? Why don't we study humans? This reflects ignorance of science. And hopefully you've learned from this course that basic science is essential. If we stop doing basic science, you're not gonna have any clinical advances. And everything I've told you today and all of our COVID vaccines depended on, on basic science. Of course, they also depend on clinical science. There's no question. But you would never have a clinical trial if you didn't know how to make an adenovirus vector. So that's my point, And I hope you do remember that, if anything, uh, from this course. So thank you for coming to this course. I really appreciate your participating in my experiment. Don't forget what, what you've learned here, please. You know where to find it. You know where to find the lectures if you need to look it up. You've got the curiosity. Don't forget, you now mo know more virology than 99.9% .9 of the world. Go out there and spread it. And do come back in the fall of 2022 for Viruses Live. That gives me incentive now to develop this course uh, over the next year. And all of you know where to find me, but I always like to show... Uh, this slide at the end. Uh, and to remind you to be curious. Look at this stuff and look at other stuff with the idea that you should never be bored. You should always be curious. So I do a lot of communicating. I have a number of podcasts, as you can see here. I put my lectures online every year, and I now do this live stream course. And um, I also write every week at Virology Blog. So that's at virology.blog. And, of course, microbe.tv is where all the podcasts are. I also uh, inhabit social media, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Facebook to uh, basically make a comment now and then and uh, put up posts when I publish uh, a new episode. So, And, if, yes, I do have viruses license plate. I no longer have this wonderful 2012 BMW at uh, – it was just falling apart, and I had to swap it. But my other, my uh, next car has a virus's license plate, and I just love watching people look at it when they're behind me and taking pictures of it. And so uh, I'm all about viruses. Viruses are me. I love them, and I hope you have uh, come to love them as well. So I want to thank um, all of you again for coming, and I also want to thank uh, the moderators, Les, Mr. Ozzy Cam, Vanity Nutrition, Steph, for being uh, at all these uh, lectures. I really, it's a lot of time. I understand they also often come to the other streams that I do. And hopefully you'll keep coming to streams that I do in the future because you are moderators and you'll keep that, that I think it's a privilege and I'm privileged to have you uh, working with me as well. So let's take a look at some final uh, comments here before we go. Um, Thank you, Mr. X. I don't know if I'm the new Carl Sagan. He had a way bigger audience than I do. And I'm working on it. Not sure I'll ever be that big, but I appreciate the comment. Thank you very much. That's, I call myself Earth's virology professor. Thank you, Barb, for your contribution. Uh, and I'm glad. Yeah, most, many of you came here because of the, the pandemic, and that's 
great. I was here. I was ready because I'd been doing this for 12 years, right? And so it was an opportune moment. Thank you, Lusik104, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Kate, for your contribution. It's better than your recorded lectures because it moves slower and live questions. Yeah, I think so. The class lectures, I'm constrained to 75 minutes. I can't go over because they have another class they have to leave for. So I have to be succinct. But I think the best part of this is you guys chatting in the background and asking good questions and talking amongst yourselves. I think that's really important. So I'll, I'll do a ecology lecture, which will probably be a Monday. It's an easier day for, but but not right away. Maybe middle January. But stay, you know, just look out for it on the. I'll, I'll post it as a scheduled uh, live stream. Thank you, Gabriel, for your contribution. Really appreciate your support of the incubator and science communication. And thank you, Michael, for your support. I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I have I am to have uh, done this and have all of you come. And hopefully you continue to come uh, to the evening Wednesday evenings Q&A with A and V. It's a different thing, of course, but uh, I think you can learn a lot there as well. And I appreciate all of your sentiments, which I'm now scrolling uh, through. I, I can't show them all, but uh, I do appreciate it. I'm glad you've learned, and um, hopefully this will stimulate you to keep on learning. I, I, you sh I should take a vacation. I don't want to. I just like doing this. Um, I will not come into the incubator Thursday and Friday. Uh, so that's my two-day vacation this week, although Thursday night I record with Daniel, but I, I like it too much. Uh, it's okay. Thank you, Trevor, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. And um, yes, I will put up um, the final exam, hopefully this weekend. If not, just give me a few days, but uh, it'll go up there. All right, folks. Thanks again to everyone for coming. Thanks to the moderators. Don't forget what you learned about viruses. Now you can answer some questions and... Um, have a happy new year, everybody. Bye-bye.